the more you give away, which is really what I was doing in a book, you know, I was, wasn't making much money off of these books. The more you give away, the more you get back. Yeah. And so I was learning some very important lessons for my ongoing coaching business. And even to the, what I do to this day, you know, their data was becoming too important to them. I would have them put a piece of tape over their handlebar computer or over the wristwatch so they couldn't see the data yeah. and then do the workout. Yeah. And then afterwards, we compared their data with what they felt, which was good feedback for the athlete because now they're, they're learning what this feeling means in terms of, de- of the data that we're looking at from a, from a device. Yeah. We need more of that. I think we need more of that. Welcome to the Training Peaks Coachcast. I'm your host, Dirk Friel. In each episode, we'll sit down with industry experts to discuss coaching methodologies, the latest research, and leading tools for endurance training. Visit trainingpeaks.com for more training and coaching resources. My next guest is one I'm especially close to and honored to have on the CoachCast. Joe Friel is not only a coach, author, and an 80-year-old who can kick butt on a bike. He is also my father. Joe is my co-founder of Training Peaks and is one of the most recognized coaches having worked with Olympians and athletes of all ages. He is also an author having written classics such as the Triathlete's Training Bible, the Cyclist's Training Bible, Your First Triathlon, the Power Meter Handbook, the Paleo Diet for Athletes, Fast After 50, and many more. We discuss the evolution of coaching and training over the decades and what the future may hold. He is my lifelong coach and mentor, and I hope you enjoy the show. All right. Well, I don't get to say this too often, but welcome to the show, Dad. (laughs) That's a good thing. (laughs) (laughs) And notice uh, I said dad and not brother. (laughs) So majority of the folks when I'm out at races, uh, conferences, et cetera, they're like, so is Joe, is your brother here? (laughs) Do you get the same? No, I don't. They know know I'm always going to meet me in in person. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. They know you have a son and, and not another brother. Okay. Uh, well, also I have to say a little belated, but just turned 80. Happy birth, belated birthday. Looking awesome. Really, what are the secrets to turning 80 and being healthy and still very active? I mean, tell us about your daily routine. Well, typically it's, it's kind of, knowing me, it's, it's kind of periodized. So uh, right now I'm doing two hours a day, aerobic exercise, but there's two separate one-hour workouts. In the springtime, it becomes one two-hour workout. And then I'm also throwing in weights a couple times a week. And and I've been doing that for all this stuff for I don't know how many years, decades. So it's just part of my lifestyle. So uh, really living what you preached in the uh, what uh, Fast After 50 book, What's different after 80, though? <laughs> well, a lot of things begin to change. You've got to kind of like, you got to kind of like sit back and be willing to accept things as they come along, but they happen more rapidly than when I was 50. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, if you stay active, that, that's the key. Staying active is really the key here. Exercise. Number one is exercise. Number two is nutrition. Number three is social aspects of your life, having other people besides just yourself. Those sorts of things, and there's more than that, but those, those, that's the big three as far as um, making it to 80, I guess, and still being able to go outside and go for a workout or whatever it is you want to do. Yeah. Well, you've certainly been a uh, you know, very big inspiration, obviously, for me and many others. So I, it, it definitely inspires me to, to lift more. And now that I'm over 50, um, I'd love for you to tell the folks how you got started in coaching. And when was that? Yeah, it's, I'll try to keep this down. It's a, it's a long, long, long story. Hey, we can take a couple hours. Well, it basically started when I was in, in, in high school. Uh, the coaches always called on me to, to kind of assist uh, them. I was I was in track team. I was uh, played football. I was on the wrestling team. And all the coaches made me kind of like their assistant coach. So I was always like helping out. I wound up being the captain of all every sport I was involved in through college. And um, so somehow I was always involved on the coaching side, although I was never a coach. And so it kind of became just normal for me to think when I went off to college, I was going to wind up being a coach. That was my, that was where I was headed. There was never any question in my mind. And so um, 
uh, after college, I graduated. I was hired to be a coach at a at a local high school in Indiana. Um, I just barely started coaching there when they had to have me go to Vietnam to win the war. So I lost four years of being in, in coaching directly. Although in Vietnam, I kept on coaching. I was coaching people over there. People come to me with questions on how to go about preparing for a football game or whatever it may be. So I was helping people prepare, and I was I was coaching. Finally, they asked me to coach one of the football teams. So I was coaching one of the football teams and playing football. This is this was supposedly like touch football, but it's more like it's more like hammerhead football. I went up getting stitches in my head a couple of times. <laughs> But anyway, that was, that was Vietnam. So I, I kind of came to uh, coaching through this long process, and, and eventually, I, I just it was just the sort of thing I knew I was always going to do, and it was part of my life. I've never felt like I wasn't a coach, quite honestly. So it's it's a long, long story. There's more to it. I don't go into all the details. All right. So you talked about how you were a football coach in Vietnam, but then how do you go from that to in becoming an endurance athlete. That's a quite a big uh, jump there. Well, I, I'd been running before that. Um, the fact that I was in Vietnam, I was running mm. probably three times a week back then. Wasn't a whole lot, a mile or two at the most. Um, so I, I was doing both. And after, um, after I came back from Vietnam, I started running more, more for fitness than anything else. Did a few races late in the 70s. And then in 1979, I decided to do a marathon, and that's when I kind of like realized that I was really doing a lot more training than I had been before. And so um, about that same time, 1980, I opened a running store, the fifth running store in the United States, as near as I can tell. Uh, there weren't too many around back then. And uh, uh, began to, the store did very well, began to hire employees. And by 1982, I had something like 13 employees at the store and um, two of them were triathletes and they they were good triathletes. If they wanted to at that time, they could have turned pro. If there was such a thing. Yeah, there weren't, there weren't too right. many of those guys around, but that they could have had they <laughs> had had been born a little bit later, they would have been pros. Yeah. They were very good. So they talked me into trying one triathlon. And so I did. And uh, I loved it. It was a great, had a great time. And so I came back from that, and I was so in love with triathlon that I talked to the guy who had the bike store next to my running store, and I bought him out, and I took down the wall between the two stores and had the probably the first triathlon store in the United States. I doubt if anybody beat me. Um, and so that kind of began the, the triathlon phase of my life. But I'm, now I'm doing running races and triathlons, and by the late – uh, 80s, um, I had sold the store, and at that time you were doing bike bike races, and so I was going to your races, and I decided to give bike racing a try also. So I did a bike race. I think about probably about 1988 uh, or something somewhere around there. I did a bike race. It was a criterium. Um, I survived it. But in the meantime, I kind of fell in love with that sport also. And so now I was doing running races, triathlons, and a, very seldom but occasionally bike races. In the 1990s, that continued. And so this this just becomes yeah. this long, ongoing process of me becoming a, a an endurance athlete. Yeah. Well, it certainly wasn't just the two of us. I mean, mom, Joyce, my mom, uh, did the Boston Marathon, did quite a, you know, triathlons, marathons. It was... I remember fond had a lot of fond memories of even going out in bitterly cold mornings and running dirt roads, you know, they're snow packed on Sunday mornings and doing long runs. So it was definitely in our DNA. And I, I started running of course. Um, and then triathlon cause you started doing triathlon. So I, you know, thought about doing a triathlon, but then I was like, wow, this bike thing, I could just go so much farther than running. <laughs> so it was kind of a way to me ex uh, to escape and go, you know, from one community to the next in different yeah. cities. And that's why I fell in love with, with cycling. Um, and then I remember the store. I mean, I remember, you know, as a 12 year old, amazing having, having this running store and stocking the shelves, et cetera. And dusting was kind of <laughs> my job. Um, but then buying the bike shop next door, that was immense. Like for me as a cyclist to, 
you know, have a bike shop um, at my disposal. And so that would, that was great, great memories. But somehow along the lines, then you got back into coaching and this time with endurance athletes. So mm-hmm. how, how, how do you, how does a retailer, you know, take on coaching and what, it wasn't even a thing back then. I mean, no. coaching endurance athletes. No, in fact, I know of no other, the only, the only endurance athlete or endurance coaches there were back then. This is now we're talking about the 1980s, early 1980s. Um, the only endurance coaches were at schools, like yeah, right. high school coaches, college coaches. Public, yeah. Sometimes occasionally you'd find a, a, a team coach who did this kind of like a, like a hobby, but there weren't any other freelance coaches who just, that's all they did was coach. But I didn't start off doing that. I started off and, and I had the running store, which became the triathlon store. Yeah. And by the way, triathlon bikes and, and cycling, bike racing bikes were the same back then. There weren't any differences between them at all. So I had both road racers coming in to buy bikes. There was no mountain bikes yet. Yeah. And uh, triathletes coming in to buy the very same bikes. So, you know, all I had know was just a few bikes that were good for everybody. And so um, I started doing more of that, but people started asking for help with getting ready for their races. They were doing a, a running race or a triathlon or a bike race, whatever it may be. And it became known that I had a, a, a master's degree in exercise science. So I was getting lots of people asking me to how to go about getting ready for their race. And so I started out just telling them, you know, while I'm putting their shoes on their foot and ex- explaining their running shoe and tell them how to train for a marathon. And eventually they started saying, would you write that down for me? And so I'd make just notes on a piece of paper and hand it to them and they bought the shoes. And that kind of got me started in coaching. And after a while that became, um, it became to the point that people were coming in just for the coaching, not to buy shoes. And at this point I realized I was kind of putting myself out of business because I'm now attracting people for my coaching, which is free. Yeah. And they're not buying shoes necessarily when they come in or bikes or anything else. And so at that point, I decided I'm going to start charging. This is, I got to scare people away from the coaching <laughs> so I can make more money off my Good store. Good problem to have maybe, but <laughs> yeah, so opportunity. I, so I, I decided what I'll do is I'll charge $5. If you want a training plan, uh, I'll charge $5. Yeah. And uh, I thought that that will surely scare them away. Nobody will $5, pay five dollars a week or five dollars for training plan. I'll just write down, you know, what to do for a couple of weeks is five dollars. <laughs> that will scare people away. It yep. did just the opposite. People uh, yeah. saw it was a bargain. Had value. So they came in, and I just started writing down training plans and started charging more. And I kept going. My fee kept going up and up and up and up. And by about nineteen eighty five, I realized I was making more money off of coaching than I was off the store. <laughs> And so then I began to think about, well, selling the store might be a good thing to do. And that finally happened in 1987. And then I became a freelance coach. Oh, yeah. Well, we also had, you had employees that were uh, studying physiology at Colorado State University, which is across the street from the running store. And the store was foot of the Rockies on the west side of, uh, of the campus there. And it was, I, th- I remembered it being like a think tank. You know, I mean, yeah. you guys would debate training topics, intervals, length of intervals, intensity of intervals. And, you know, and staff would literally go, go home and find research and come back in the next day and present the research to right. the, the other staff members. So it was like this great think tank. Yeah, it was. Um, this is about the same time. This is 1983. I realized that my master's degree, <laughs> which I'd gotten in 1977, really wasn't all that great anymore. I was beginning to see a lot more stuff just yeah. in the, in the normal you know, magazines and such about the science of training. And it was beyond me already in only six years. So the sports science went from zero to a hundred in six years. Yeah. So 83, I realized I was behind the curve. And so I just start reading more research. I just started a, a lifelong process of reading research studies. And, but the other people you're right. I had a couple of people working in the store that were um, working on their, their doctorates or masters in, in sports sciences who were good runners and good cyclists and good triathletes themselves. I had a, uh, one pro runner working for me. And so I had this, this kind of like this, this great group of people who would come together on a regular basis and we would talk about training. And as you mentioned, people would talk about the research they could use to, to, to kind of like bolster their idea about how to train. And what I found was people began to come in the store just to talk to us about training or to listen to us talk about training. 
So we started putting on clinics for people, and the whole the whole thing just began mm-hmm. to become a whole new thing rather than just a, a store. Yeah, it became a, a center of, of ideas for how to train. And I, I would bring in speakers from uh, around the state who were good people in, in their field to talk in, to my clients about training. So it became a kind of a focus of of the endurance sport community in in Northern Colorado. Yeah, well. You also realized along with running the store and coaching, you also owned races. So you had the Rawhide Marathon, the I think you ran the Colorado one. Colorado, yeah, Colorado run. 10K. Um, and at one point the wheelchair world record was yeah. set on <laughs> your course. Tell That's us about right. that. Yeah, the we had a marathon that started, I think in nineteen eighty two. We started there was a marathon that it was point to point and it was all downhill. So it was a fast marathon. Tailwind from Wyoming. It could be a tailwind also <laughs> on certain times. Uh, so the, that year, 1982 is, or I think, I think it was the year. It was a, a really fast race. We had a guy come in from uh, Mexico who was running like 210, 212 in that neighborhood. Huh. So he was kind of like our, our big name at that yeah. time. Nobody knows him today. In fact, I can't remember his name myself now. But we started bringing in more people for the race. And uh, the second year, we had people uh, come to us who were wheelchair athletes. And they wanted to know if they can compete, which, fine, yeah, it was no problem at all. And being a downhill course, they had, you know, a very <laughs> fast times. Yeah. So they were turning in race times of like, if I recall right, like about an hour and 50 minutes for a marathon. Huh. Um and, and nobody, it was kind of like uh, the Wild West for wheelchair uh, racing back in those days. There, there were no rules. Yeah. So one guy. The equipment some, is a lot faster now. Oh, I'm sure. Unbelievable. <laughs> but what, back then they had some just had regular wheelchairs that you'd yeah. use around the house or whatever, or work or whatever. One guy had a, uh, a, a device that he got from a hospital. I remember, yeah, I remember this. And it was like, it was like a table that, that they would lay you on if they brought you into the hospital for the ER or something. Only it wasn't gigantic. It was a small table. He would lay on his belly with that with ski poles. Yeah, they were like these little like 14-inch like ski poles with right. tips on the end. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. And so he he broke the record for a while. He had the record. But there was this great hubbub among all the uh, wheelchair racers about whether or not that yeah, was fair to legal. do that. Right. Because it was no aerodynamic drag at all. He was lying down on his and belly. And there was a TV show like, amazing things or something like that they came and like filmed an episode right about it yeah so there was a lot of stuff going on it was it was you know everything was brand new Uh, running was just was really just kind of getting started big time triathlon was in its early stages uh wheelchair racing was in its early stages sports science was in its early stages all the things things were coming together at the same time and i just happened to be in the right place at the right time with an interest and that's what took me through all this stuff to yeah. write a book eventually. Well, a drive and, and a vision, I guess. Um, okay, so sell the store. You have this coaching business now. I mean, ha- you had no real other model to work off of because there weren't any other coaches. So what were, you, what were you charging then? How many athletes did you have? How were you communicating with them? Well, I was by the time I sold the store, I was charging $72 a month for a churning plant. That number came from the fact that that's, that's what uh, spas and health clubs were charging was about $72 a month. So I figured it was about the same thing. So I charged that. But I figured out I had to have something like, I've forgotten, about 70 clients to, to make a, a living off of this, off of $72 a month. <laughs> and so um, uh, I had to find other jobs. And so I had two other jobs I did part time. One was um, as a fundraiser for a nonprofit organization in town that worked with with youth, a very a great organization. And so I was did, I was basically in charge of fundraising for that organization, uh, which was something brand new for me I'd never done before. But I'd become fairly well known in town because of my store, and so I had people that opened doors for me, and I could walk in and talk to them about about making a donation to my to this company or to this mm-hmm. this uh, nonprofit. So I was doing that, and also got a job. Um, editing a, uh, a triathlon magazine that came out monthly. Um, we were only two employees in the entire store, or in the entire business, rather. Uh, my job was to, to write stories from everything from Japan to the <laughs> Mississippi River. 
race reports, uh, race reports, which I got from the, from the athletes who ran the race. I would talk to them and they would write up pizzas for me and give them to me. And I'd give them a free some subscription to the magazine. <laughs> and the other person handled everything from the Mississippi river to Japan. So we kind of broke the world <laughs> into two halves and we started, we wrote race uh, stories about the races and we had a, a publisher back east someplace, I think it was in New York City, if I recall right. It was published once a month, uh, Triathlon Today, it was called. And so I did that for a few years also. So I had to do these things to make money to, to pay the bills. And But by 1982, I'm sorry, 1992, I, I, meet, I met my goal of having 70 clients at paying $72 a month. And when I knew I, when I got to that point, I knew I could quit my two jobs. So mm -hmm. I did. And now I was just coaching. That was 1992. And so finally I could, I wasn't working 24 hours a day. I was just working a normal, relatively normal schedule. Still a lot of time at 72 clients. And so the whole thing just kind of bloomed after that with going into, um, eventually starting a coaching business and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so it, it began to grow after 19, 1992. Yeah. Well, there may be some running coaches out there still charging $72 a month <laughs> and 70 hours. Probably. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but the whole professionalism of the career path of becoming a coach is certainly legitimized. I mean, it's a couple decades old now. So, uh, you, you know, what is your biggest surprises or, or revelations of seeing that growth from the very beginning to today? Um, did you en envision that it would become so, so big or do you see it even not maybe not being big? Like it's still we haven't achieved Oh, we've, we've still got a ways to go. Yeah. Uh, no, no question about that. But back in the early 90s when I was uh, – I, I found out in 1989 there was another triathlon coach in the United States. I think I read about him in a magazine someplace. His name was mentioned. Um, and so I contacted him. He was in California. Uh, I forgot the name of the city he was in. He was in California, and I called him and asked him if I could – already probably wrote him a letter because I, I didn't have a phone number, but I got it, somehow I got his address. I wrote him a letter. There's no email, of course, and ask if I could come out and just visit him. I wanted to talk to somebody who's doing the same thing I was doing mm -hmm. to pick their brain. And so he said, yeah, sure. So I flew out to California uh, about 1989, and we spent a day together just talking about training. And it was like, this is like amazing for me because I, I didn't know anybody else was doing this besides me. So he, as far as I knew, was the second triathlon coach in the United States. He's still around, by the way. His name is Mark Evans. Uh, he's written a couple of books mm -hmm. on triathlon. A great guy. We're still good friends. And um, so we began to, like, talk to each other. And when I had more clients than I could handle, I would send them to him, and he would do the same for me. And so we kind of helped one another out. And in 1997, um, I'd been talking with the USA Triathlon Federation, um, which was called back in those days, about um, uh, doing some things for training coaches. And they were very keen on the idea. So together, all the coaches they knew of the United States in 1997 in, in Color Springs, and there were, if I recall right, 13 of us who got together, began to kind of like draw up the, the ideas of how to train coaches for triathlon. And that became the foundation for coaches training programs that we now have in, in various, uh, you know, in, in triathlon and cycling and running and so forth. We were one of the first ones to do that, um, that I know of. I don't know of any other sport having done that yet. Somebody may have, I haven't heard about yet, but we kind of drew up a plan for how to do it. And uh, so I stuck around for a few years with the uh, USA triathlon kind of helping to design the program and, and chairing the, the committee that put it together but that's, as far as I knew, 13 coaches were all there were in 1997. By the early 2000s, there may have been a few hundred, but now we're talking thousands. There, there yeah. are lots of coaches anymore. It's unbelievable yeah. what we've come to now compared to where I started back in you know, the 1980s. Yep, yep. Um, so and then along the way, you become an author and the Cyclist Training Bible, Triathletes Training Bible, Mountain Bikers Training Bible get released. Uh, how does that opportunity come along and, and, you know, what, how does that project get kicked off and what, what, around what year was that? That was, that was a, a weird one. Um, I was writing for in 1990 or 91, right around there, I was writing for Velo News Magazine, a cycling publication, monthly cycling publication. 
writing a, a monthly column for them. And uh, they had a sister business, sister uh, company, owned by the same same uh, company, the same same people, called uh, Velo Press Publishing or Velo Publishing. No, Velo Press. I'll take it. Velo Press Publishing. And so um, they liked what I was writing for the magazine, so they asked if I would write a book. That was 1993, if I recall right. And I turned them down. I said, I just didn't have time. I'm coaching like 72 people. And, I'm, and, and, that, and when they first contacted me, I was, had three jobs. I, there was no way I was going to write it. So I, but that was in the back of my brain that somebody wanted me to write a book, but I didn't see it as being anything other than just me spending a lot of time writing something, not making any money off of it or, or any, anything else. So I turned it down. never really thought much about it beyond that point. But in 1993, uh, my wife and I, went to a world championship in Australia in, in duathlon. And this was in like November because it, it had been summer down there then. And I caught a, what I thought was a bad cold while I was down there, came back from, in, from that race in 1993 and the cold lingered by the following March. So now March of 1994, I've still got this cold. I've got a, it's in my chest. I'm coughing. I just don't feel right. But being a stupid Self-coached athlete decided to do a half marathon anyway. So in Mar- and I knew I knew it was March because that this this race is still run to this day mm-hmm. every March. And so I I um, signed up for the race, ran it, but realized well into the race that my heart rate was really high, much higher than I'd ever seen it before. And so when I got done, uh, my wife had run the race also. She when she finished, we got together and talked about it and. And I decided I need I needed to see my doctor about this. It's something not is not good about this. And so I went to see my doctor, and the doctor referred me to a cardiologist. Cardiologist ran some tests and decided I had a, a something called a viral myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the of the heart muscles caused by a virus. And apparently, I'd gotten a virus while I was in Australia and it settled in my heart. And uh, so the doctor said, "You really." shouldn't do any exercise at all. In fact, you shouldn't get your heart rate above about 80 for the next several months until this thing goes away. So I now all of a sudden I had like additional 15 hours a week. So I called the publisher and said, Hey, all all of a sudden I can write this book. (laughs) So they were the upside getting injured. (laughs) There's always a bright side to everything that happens. I found. (laughs) So I wrote the book. The first book was a cyclist turning Bible. I thought it'll sell a couple hundred copies, but you know, at least I'll know that, I was able to write down and, and justify how I train athletes. That was kind of like the whole crux of the book. The first month it sold something like 5,000 copies, I was told. So I was like blown away. I didn't think it'd sell that many in seven years and it sold in one month. And so the next thing I knew, they were asking me to write another book. So I wrote the Mountain Bikers Training Bible, still same, staying with the cycling um, thread. Then I wrote a book about uh, aging, cycling past 50, it was called. And then I wrote the triathletes training Bible. So that was the first few books. And those all took place like in about a period of about four years, probably I wrote those books, those four books. And I was beginning to see myself as being something like a coach who writes books. And then later on, I started becoming a writer who coached. And so it's kind of like went through this process of becoming more of a writer and less of a coach. Although I still love coaching and still to this day, enjoy talking to coaches yeah. and being around them, even though I don't, I don't coach athletes anymore. I coach coaches now more than anybody else. Yeah. I had a flashback. I remember coaches saying, Joe, don't keep writing those books. You're going to put us out of business. <laughs> yeah. Does that sound a little familiar today with yeah. uh, AI chatter and such, et cetera? Yeah. I was, I was told by, <laughs> you're going to tell people how to coach. No, <laughs> I was told by many people they, they'll never hire you again because all they could do now is buy yeah. your book. It's and all done. 1795. They've got all the, all the thing. Yep. And it was just the opposite actually. And that, that, caused me to learn something, uh, an important lesson. I learned from that, that uh, the more you give away, which is really what I was doing in a book, you know, I was, wasn't making much money off of these books. The more you give away, the more you get back. Yeah. And so I was learning some very important lessons for my ongoing coaching business. And even to the, what I do to this day, if somebody asks me a, co- a question on Twitter, I always answer the question. If somebody sends me an email and has a question, I always answer the question. I won't make any money off of that. Mm-hmm. And that, that's not the whole reason we live. I'm not, I'm not living to make money. 
I see myself as being here to help people. And when I found it, when, the more I help people, the more I get back out of it, uh, the more books they buy and, and so forth. So it's just been a great learning experience for me, this, this whole thing, everything about it, you know, the, the bad experience with the, the viral myocarditis turning into me becoming a, an author yeah. is like a great experience to, 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 to learn that you, if you really are focused on what you want to do and you help other people, you'll, you'll grow. Yeah. That actually reminds me of the, some of the founding kind of stories around training peaks and, mm -hmm. and at the early year, you know, I mean, from the beginning, we training peaks was originally for, and I, by this time, nine, 1997, I started coaching with you. 1999 is when we had the idea around some web-based something. It, let's just get away from the fax machine. Well, you, I, you had the idea, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this, you know, dad, there's this dot com thing. Imagine the possibilities, get off the fax and email attachments and get off all these downloadable software apps and Excel, et cetera. And, and uh, so we launched it really for our internal purposes within our coaching group at the time was called UltraFit Associates. Mm -hmm. And it was really so we could provide a better quality service to our athletes. It could help us become more efficient, effective coaches. Um, but really early on, we kind of turned that around and, and exposed it to other coaches, you know, and I do remember other coaches saying, wow, why, why would you do that? That's such a great tool. Why would you give that to your competition? And like, we never actually saw it that way. We saw it as like, oh, this is going to help, you know, all coaches. Of, of course, we're going to charge for it, you know, a fair price, but it's, you know, it's, a, you know, bettering the community, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of, I guess, instilled in our, in the DNA of training peaks as well from the beginning. And it can, can continues to today through our educational efforts. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the training bubble series of books and all of that. And I have right here your latest, and this just, just came out recently. So the latest edition, um, what did fifth edition train, uh, yeah, fifth. triathletes training Bible. Um, what are the biggest changes over the decades or within all the five editions of the triathletes training Bible? So yeah. from beginning to today, kind of what is, what are the biggest changes? Yeah, the biggest change is probably in a, in a broad overview is just that it's become a lot more a lot more science in the book. Although I don't I don't try to make it scientific. Mm. I just it, the the things I talk about are based on science. When I first wrote that book, um, sports science really wasn't doing wasn't all that great. It wasn't really anything like we have today. Today we're overwhelmed with uh, data from sports science. Uh, there's all kinds of research studies. When I started reading research studies back in the early 80s, I would had, had to go to the library to get these, and they were hard to find. Now you go on Twitter or wherever you go, or X, wherever you want to call it, you go online and you you're you can find, you know, a dozen uh, research studies a day online that you can open right there and read them from your desk. Yep. I had to chase them down to find them, but now they're very easy to find. But back in the when I wrote the book in the '90s, there really wasn't that much available yet. They were starting to become more available. So I wrote about the little bit of science I knew that I was applying in my coaching. But by the fifth edition, which just came out, uh, that book is very heavily based on scientific concepts, mm -hmm. very common ideas to us today that we don't think anything about. But they were they were something we'd never thought about back in the back in the, uh, the 1990s, like, for example, polarized training. Mm. We, that never would have crossed anybody's mind back in the 1990s, but now it's a very, it's a very important topic to talk about with, um, with athletes. And so the book talks about that. It talks about the pyramidal training as, a, as another way of doing this whole concept of dividing the, the time and training, the distribution of time and training into various ways of organizing your workouts. So those sorts of things now are much more common in the book, whereas back in the 90s when I wrote the first book, it was largely my opinion based on just a little bit of scattering of science, but things that I had found that worked with athletes. And, mm -hmm. and so it's kind of grown to become more science-based, but not scientific. It's not by any means a science book. It's, it's a book about how to train in, incorporating some ideas from science. Yeah. How about within coaching? What have you seen? I mean, 
coaching is now really, you know, has become true business, right? Yeah. And there's large businesses and there's small businesses. Um, but what are the, yeah. uh, let's say on the kind of business side of things and puts training aside for right now, you know, what, what have you seen in terms of changes within coaching as a profession and maybe some insights into where you see it maybe going? Yeah, there's there's some funny things there also. I, I can recall when this is before the days of uh, of um, of apps, you know, meeting apps online like yeah. Zoom and so forth. Uh, I was of course trying to com communicate with people by any various ways I could find, which involved everything. But it often came down to a telephone call. I, I'd phone the people once a week or so, my athletes once a week, and talk with them. And back in those days, I didn't ne necessarily ever see my clients. Uh, in fact, when I would eventually get a picture of them or something, it was kind of like amazing because I, I, you kind of get a vision of what the person looks like from talking <laughs> to them. And the, the vision doesn't always jive with what that person actually looks like. But today, you know, being able to see somebody's face while you're talking to them, they may be on the other side of the world, but you're talking through a, a meeting app. Um, I see that as being a tremendous thing because the number one, the best way to coach an athlete is face to face. And I mean, so you can actually touch the athlete. That's yeah. that's face to face yeah. coaching. So I, if I was to coach an athlete, I met with them every morning, for example, at the track or at the pool or on a bike, work, whatever it may be. And I can see their face, see their body language, shake hands with them, ask them how they're feeling, see how their face reacts when they talk about yesterday's workout. All these sorts of things that I couldn't do at all on a telephone are now almost entirely possible, not quite, a, I can't touch the person anymore and put my hand in their back and pat their back when they tell me they're having a, a hard week or something like that. But I can now see their face online. That for me is like an amazing tool. I wish I'd had that yeah. back when I was coaching. That, yeah. that, that's, a, that's a game changer right there. Yeah. I mean, tech, that's enabled through technology. In a way, society is becoming less interpersonal. You, you were getting farther and farther away from in-person yeah. <laughs> experiences. Um, but yet coaching the number, you know, the best way to coach somebody, as you just mentioned, is see them, see their techniques, see their, you know, their, their emotion, how well they're recovering in the morning, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that we're getting like farther away from in-person coaching. Um, you know, and obviously training peaks helps enable that, but we've never created training peaks to be a replacement for, in-person premium, you know, coaching. Um, so hopefully we can bring some of that back. Yeah. Who, who knows what the way technology is going anymore. There may be something that allows us to become even more, even closer to the athlete yeah. and simply seeing them on, on your phone or on your, iP on your, uh, on your machine, yeah. your, your computer. But yeah, that, that's the sort of stuff that that's for me, it sounds like a little thing anymore. I'm sure people take that for granted anymore, but, for me, that would have been just a gigantic tool to have to be able to see the athlete that I'm talking to online. When I first started coaching, I always met with the clients. That was it was all mm -hmm. one on one. It was mm -hmm. personalized. Right, local. I'd, yeah. I'd meet them wherever it was they were going to do the workout. I'd meet them there, and we'd do it together. And uh, so you learn an awful lot about people when you spend time with them. Yeah. Which wasn't after that. After we got started growing, I had people you know all over the world. I could no longer do that. And I began to feel a little bit remote from my clients. Zoom brings that back a little bit or other meeting apps like Zoom brings that back a little bit, but it's still not back to where I would like to see it be, but I'm never, not sure we can really ever get back to that point exactly. Yeah. I mean, I see people out doing intervals and form is absolutely horrendous. Mm. And if a proper coach was just there and helped them on their form, they could get faster in a month than three or four months of that interval training. Sure. And, and other, and other aspects of sport too, like weightlifting. There's so much, there's so much that an athlete who has never lifted weights needs to know. And you, so you give them a drawing or something, uh, or something online to show them what it looks like. But just having the, the, the coach there to correct, make little corrections that the athlete may not be aware of. It's gigantic in the pool, in the pool. The athlete yeah. has no idea what the, what their body is doing because everything's underwater. So you, it's even worse than weight training because you can't see anything at all. Yeah. So having some feedback from a coach is like gigantic 
um, value for making the athlete into the athlete they want to become. So there's an awful lot yet to be done in sport. We're getting closer all the time. Videos and such are becoming much more common for things like you're bringing up with, with technique. So these sorts of things are coming closer to us, but they're still, still a long ways off, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back in time. We're 35 years ago or something, 1990. Um, you, you start with one, you start with two athletes, one with the technology of that day and age versus this, you know, different athlete in today's day and age data, you know, or technology, you obviously might have, a, you know, five years worth of data from, uh, an athlete in today's day and age, mm. you know, to look at within training peaks, et cetera. Uh, so you, you, you know, there's some dramatic differences in how you might start even coaching an athlete. So what are those differences you see in terms of like maybe even starting from day one uh, as a better coach? Oh yeah, no, it's no question. Yeah, we've now got we've now got so much data collected, excuse me, on the athlete that we can we can see things that have been going on for that athlete for going back a long ways, as you mentioned, and that that's a very valuable tool for a coach being able to know what your athlete's been doing prior to their, their coming to you. Yeah. As far as when I would get an athlete, I had to ask the athlete questions. You know, how have you been training? What's your training been like? What kind of workouts did you do? How often did you swim? How often did you, and so forth. I had to go through all the details and pull it out of the athlete. They sometimes didn't remember how they'd done it in the last few years, and they, or, they would, or they would magnify uh, what they did so right. they would seem more important in my eyes, which was a big mistake to make. But you weren't always sure you were getting exactly what you needed to know. Right. And you, and, and in today's technology, you are seeing more immediate effects of that workout that you gave them. I mean, mm -hmm. you're seeing more data come back. Um, and, and so that's helping you adjust micro adjust day to day as well. There is, there's one, I only have one problem with it. Um, I go back to when I first started as a runner, you know, junior high, high school, college, the only person, the only data we had was a stopwatch. Yeah. This is running. That was the only data we had. Uh, in fact, no other sport had any other data whatsoever. Swimming had a stopwatch also, but biking, cycling didn't have anything at all. So um, the coach had a, a, a stopwatch, which is pretty big in those days. He wore around his neck on a lanyard. And so the coach, when he was doing a workout, he, he, had, he was a source of information. Yeah. So if you're running intervals, for example, in the track, you only find out how fast you ran if the coach gave you the, data, the information at the end of the interval. Otherwise, you were in total darkness the you entire time. You didn't have a Garmin on your wrist? Yeah, had absolutely nothing. <laughs> in fact, we didn't have, stop, didn't have stopwatches until 1971 when the first stopwatch came out, and that was like five years after I graduated from college. <laughs> but it was a great thing to have. But, but before that, we had absolutely nothing. So the... Um, so the coach was in charge of everything. Yeah. He, he had all the data. He knew everything, but you knew nothing. And so that kind of created this relationship between coach and athlete, which was kind of weird that that the coach has all the data and he can, he can share or not share the data with the athlete. The, data has, the athlete has no data, but the athlete had only one thing. And that one thing we're lacking today, which is we call radiant and perceived exertion. Mm -hmm. We didn't call it then. It was just how did you mm -hmm. feel? And you would say, well, it was a hard workout. It was an easy workout. It was a moderate workout. And that was, that was kind of like RPE. We were talking yeah. about how our, our exertion level. That's all we had. But the interesting thing about that was it was a lot, a lot more, in some ways, more valuable than all the data we get today because it forced you to become in tune with your body. Yeah. You had to think about how am I feeling at this moment in time the entire time you were doing the workout. Could I go faster or should I go slower? It was an internal thing. It was nothing external. I wasn't looking at any data on my handlebars or on my wrist. I was making this decision for myself based on how I felt. That, that's something we've kind of lost, and I'd like to see us get more of that back again. In fact, in my newest edition of the Triathletes Training Bible, I talk about more of using RPE, of readying a perceived exertion, yeah. and always be thinking in terms of that. When I was coaching athletes, for example, um, a, a road cyclist, I would have them at sometimes if they were becoming too too important or their data was becoming, become, becoming too important to them, I would have them put a piece of tape over their handlebar computer or over the wristwatch so they couldn't see the data yeah. and then do the workout. Yeah. And then afterwards, we'd compare their data with what they felt. 
which is good feedback for the athlete because now they're they're learning what this feeling means in terms of de- the data that we're looking at from a, from a device. Yeah, we need more of that. I think we need more of that. Yeah, and you're seeing that the more elite the athlete is, more experienced, they can actually pretty much spot on guess heart rate, pace, power, and that's crucially important. Like on race day, you bet. No question about that. When I, I recall in my running days, I could do intervals on the track. This is before I had a stopwatch and I could tell you what, what yeah. my pace was within one or two seconds. If yeah. you're like, you're running quarters, you know, 400 meter repeats. I could get within a couple of seconds of what my time was just by how I felt. Um, today, I don't see people doing that. We, we, in fact, I used to do games with my clients on the track. We'd run intervals together and, um, uh, one person would could not wear a watch and the other one could. And the person who was not wearing a watch had to guess what their time was when they finished. Mm-hmm. And I and then I, as the coach, I could tell them whether or not they were right. And then and they would do it to me. They would wear the watch and I would guess how what my time was when I finished. It was amazing how close we could yeah. come to our times just based on how we felt. I don't see anything going on like that. I don't, I don't see it to that extent. There are some people talk about it, but it's, there's not as valuable as it used to be. But yeah. Very, very important information. Okay. You, you cross the divide from objective data to subjective RPE. Yeah. If we take that a, a few rungs out and we talk about psychology or mood, emotion coming into play, making decisions day to day off that, I mean, that's a, a crucial role of the coach as well. And that's where some of the face to face or Zoom phone call that can really educate the coach as to like, readiness, if you will, but it's not coming from the HRV. It's not coming from how low was your heart rate last night? How many hours do you sleep? But this emotion, this psychology of, of, of readiness. Uh, and that's another crucial role of coach as well, being that almost psychologist interpreting. Yeah. Or, or interpreting not only psychology, but what you see happening in front of you, if you're at the workout with the athletes are doing. Yeah. When I was coach, this is back in the days when I was one-on-one with my clients. I can recall going to the track and watching people do their intervals and my, I saw my job. My only job was to decide when they should stop. That was what it was all about. That's why I was there. I wasn't there to make them work harder. They could do that themselves. In fact, that's usually counterproductive. My biggest job was to decide when I see things happening that aren't the way it should be. Form is breaking down slightly. Yeah. They're breathing a little bit heavier than they should be when they finish the interval, whatever. I, that's when I decide to, to call the workout and stop it right then. So that sort of thing was what you do when you have a hands-on coach and you're, you're doing things other than data. You're, yeah, you're thinking in terms fluid. of the athlete. Yeah. You're it's thinking, fluid. what is, what is the athlete experiencing right now? What can I see them experiencing? And from that draw conclusions of how long, how much farther should we go in this workout? Yeah. Well, there's been trends back on the objective side of things with data. I mean, there's these trends we go through. Uh, again, 1990, nobody had a power meter. You know, my first races with the power meter were about 98 or so with what was called a tune, which was the precursor to the power top made by tune. And it was a, a hub power meter. And then they were purchased or I guess become power top and et cetera. Um, and then, so everybody had, let, let's talk cycling prior to power meters, everybody had heart rate and we're trying, and I remember reading these Dutch training books from polar, you know, on deciphering heart rate and heart rate drift, et cetera. <clears throat> then we all got power meters. And then for a, a certain amount of time, heart rate went to the side, like nobody dealt with heart rate. It seems like the trend in the marketplace of cycling and somewhat in triathlon was just power. It's just power. Like heart rate doesn't matter. And now, you know, like talk to us about, I mean, there's so much value in seeing those two together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I began to see this back in, I, I, about 19, or let's, let's go back about 2002. I think it was, I told anybody that came on board as a new client, they had to have a power meter and a heart rate monitor cyclist. Now we're talking about that's like a million dollars back then. Yeah. It, it was expensive, <laughs> but I, I had, Fortunately, I had people who could afford those things, clients. And so they had to have a power meter and they had to have a heart rate monitor. And so I began to look at data. And in the first couple of years, it was a lot of stuff going on. And I was kind of like trying to figure it out. But eventually, I began to notice one thing when I look at those two things together. I looked at heart rate and power for the same workout for the athlete. 
I noticed that they they typically had a parallelism about them. They, they followed the same route. If heart rate was rising, power was rising. If power was falling, heart rate was falling. That's interesting. It makes sense, but that's what I began to notice. But then I noticed at some points they might not do that. At some points, usually late in the workout, they would go their separate ways. Mm-hmm. You'd hold a given power output and your heart rate began to rise. Whereas early in the workout, that same power output, the heart rate was very flat. So that was interesting. So what's this telling me? Well, it's telling me the athlete is, is, is losing their, their, their aerobic fitness isn't good beyond that point. Beyond that point where they begin to come apart, heart rate and power begin to separate from one, which, uh, each other, which I call decoupling. When they began to separate, that was telling me that at this point, we're not aerobically fit. We need to build our aerobic fitness beyond this point so we can get through these types of workouts. So I began to see some information there. Then the second thing that came to me in looking at this data was that if I compared, when the workout was over, if I compared heart rate and power over the workout, um, I should see things happening over time that told me valuable information. If I, if I took their, their power, uh, the athlete's power for the workout, for example, or for an interval or yeah. for any segment of the workout and divided that by their heart rate, I would get this number, just a number. It meant nothing by itself. The next time I had them do that same workout, I'd do the same thing. I would look at a different number now. Did the number go up or down? Well, what I want to see happen is the number goes up. Yeah. Because what that's telling me is the athlete is becoming more efficient. Yeah. They're not wasting. They're using less energy to go faster. In other words, the same heart rate, they're going faster. Yep. So what we're measuring there is watts per beat, per heartbeat. And so what I want to see how over time is that number rises. That would be extremely valuable because it tells me the aerobic fitness is improving. It doesn't work with, with high intensity anaerobic type workouts. It only works with steady low state. intensity. Yeah. yeah, steady, low intensity workouts. It works great there. It's a great marker of how you're doing, but I don't see people paying enough attention yeah. to it. I think it's one of the most important, value, important data points you could be, be looking at, especially in your base period of training is how is my aerobic fitness doing right now compared with my heart rate? Well, over the decades, we use different terms for the same thing. <laughs> so yeah. I think in, today in, within uh, the media, if you will, endurance media, you know, you hear obviously zone two, um, you know, Dr. Indigo Sanmayan, Dr. Seiler, um, you know, popularizing the, you know, the zone two um, kind of training zone, if you will. And, and another term folks are using is durability now. Hmm. So that's the same thing. It's, it's decoupling. So if you start and let's say your zone two is 220 watts, but yet your heart rate rises more than 7% over the next hour at 220 watts, yeah. you may have to reframe that and say, maybe 220 is not my zone two. I had too much decoupling. Hence, if I extrapolate that out to five hours, you know, I can't even maintain 220 Watts. Your durability is not there. Right. So these, you know, these metrics are in training peaks. And if you're looking for decoupling, it's, you know, heart rate to power or heart rate to pace ratio. And then you mentioned, you didn't say it, but it's efficiency factor. Mm -hmm. And we, we just have an EF and then the the value 1.9 or whatever it might be for that uh, workout or segment, you can highlight a segment of a workout. You can warm up, cool down, and then a 90 minute effort and look at these values. So we, I mean, we are discussing, especially in pro cycling these days, there's a lot of talk around durability and that's really the same in triathlon. It's the difference between age groupers and professionals. Mm -hmm. What can you do after 3000 kilojoules? What can you do after whatever it is, 200 TSS? What can you do after three hours? And if, if, if you're fresh, yeah, you, you know, you have an, you know, a young age grouper and a professional, they might do the very same 20 minute power output or 60 or whatever it might be. But once you add in that volume after three hours or four hours, that difference grows and, and that professional athlete really shines. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, but yet this decoupling concept is, I mean, it's been in training peaks for 15 years, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a whole, 
interesting topic. This, this, this one dawned on me. I was watching the Tour de France a few years ago, and there was a rider whose name I've forgotten now. This is, he was a pretty good breakaway rider, and he was in a break of four or five, and they got off early, and it was like a, they, were, they, they held on for, uh, for most of five hours, but one rider won the race, won the, the stage, uh, af after five hours. And I looked at his data, interesting data. His data was he held 75% of his, uh, FTP. His FTP was probably 400. Yeah. So he, he held about 300 Watts for 300 minutes. And that struck me. That's interesting. 300 Watts for 300 minutes. Huh. That, that is really on the edge of what you're calling durability. I call stamina. Yeah. It's being able to ha hang on for a long time. Uh, the, you know, 75% is, is what he was doing by itself is not a big number. You, anybody can go out and ride 75% of their FTP for, for a while. Yeah. Try to do it for as long as number of minutes, which is the same as the, the as the FTP, as the number itself, like right. 300 watts for 300 <laughs> minutes. Now we're talking stamina or durability. Yeah, we're 200, talking being, 200. Yeah. Talking about hanging on for a long time. Yeah. That that is a good sign of yeah. what an athlete needs, no matter what their sport is. If you, if it's marathon running or uh, time trialing or triathlon or bike racing, you need to have that kind of stability. Otherwise, you're really yeah. not a, a, an endurance athlete. Yeah, yeah. I, I I bring this up partly because I saw a clickbait article uh, recently about durability, the new thing in pro cycling. You know, as if as if it's like this new, completely new concept, but yet. You know, as you know, uh, an, an experienced endurance coaches have really seen that ever since, you know, from the beginning of their of their coaching career. So it's it's just funny how things get uh, they come they boil up in terms of different scenarios or different terms, but yet it all relates back to these simple basic uh, coaching concepts. Yeah, we're we're able to measure data now, so uh, so deeply so much yeah, data we can right. look at but we've got to narrow it down to what's important you can't look at all the data so what's what's important and this, right. this is one i think it's very important yeah. if you're coaching endurance athlete they need to have endurance they need to be able to hang on for a long time at a relatively yeah. high pace power speed whatever you want to look at they got to be able to hang on for a long time yeah. and you need to build that in the athlete that needs to be one of the things that they that becomes the focus of their training is is what you're calling durability. Yeah, but discipline is the key. That the first thing athletes want to do is go hard. Right. And this is what your coach is telling you absolutely do not do for 80% of your training. Right. <laughs> and so the whip has to come out. You know, you look at the data afterwards. Hey, I told you to stay below 200 watts for three hours. What's this first hour at two two thirty? Right. You know, it's like the learning along the way is another the way the coach comes into play in terms of like just whipping the athlete back into shape of no hold back. Exactly. So if you, if you, this is, this becomes then the makings of training. This is what training becomes is how do I, how does the athlete begin to do this the way that I think they should do it? Well, let's take that 300 minutes, 300 Watts at 300 minutes as an example. I don't know if this athlete, whoever it was this rider in the tour back in February could have done that. Mm-hmm. Could he have ridden yeah. three, 300 watts for 300 minutes in February? I kind of doubt it. He had to be trained to do that. He had to, this, this is something that didn't happen overnight. It's something that took a long time to get there. Break this down into pieces. Break this down to intervals. Start wind up doing whatever, whatever the number may be for, for you or your client. Break that down into pieces as intervals and then start working on it. And the athlete has got to be dedicated to doing the first interval at the pace they're supposed to be at or at the power they're supposed to be at. Yeah. That has to be done at that power. That can't be something that they do just because they felt like going faster. That's, that's not training to do what they're supposed to do. So when I had coached, when I did this with my athletes, what I would do is if they came back with a, with a, uh, um, a first interval, for example, that was well beyond what it should have been, they were pushing themselves too hard. No matter what they did, the rest of the workout, which typically saw their everything going downhill because they they burned all their matches early in the workout. Yep. What we do then is we do the same workout two days later. We come back and do it again. 
Now let's try it again. Let's get it right this time. So then the athlete learns if they don't do it right the first time, they got to do it again. Yeah. So they might as well do it the right way to get this thing figured out. So I, I kind of like it made it almost like punishment, I guess. We, we're going to do this till you get yeah. it right because this is critical to your success in the sport. You've yeah. got to be able to do this. Yeah. I mean, it's almost true if you're a, a miler and above. Exactly. You know, whether you're doing Olympic distance triathlon or, you know, criterium is actually too, you know, getting that level of repeatability within a criterium, a 90 minute criterium and doing 500 efforts out of corners, you know, having those matches to burn, the number of matches you can burn relies on that foundation that you build. Right. Yeah. And every, every sport has matches. You yeah. just don't realize it, but people right. become, become overly obsessed with, with intensity. I wish people could, be, could become overly in, in, um, dedicated to uh, their aerobic fitness. Wouldn't that be great if they became really aerobically focused? For the rest of your life. Instead of intensity focused. It's amazing what they yeah. could accomplish if they just stopped being so always wanting to go out and do the first interval, the first part of the workout as fast as they could go, no matter what that means. It's, perhaps I'm tired from yesterday, so I'll, I'll ride at a three zone today instead of riding easy, one mm -hmm. or two zone. Mm -hmm. I'll ride a little bit higher zone. Like somehow that's going to be good for them. There's absolutely nothing good about that. All that is the downside. It makes you worse by doing that. You can't, it, the hard part is getting people to do the easy workouts. If they can learn to do those, then the workouts that are more advanced, the harder workouts become easier to do. Yeah. And you, and you progress faster. So it, it's just this, we've got things, athletes, self-coached athletes, I should say, have this reverse. They think the, the, the reason they're training is to go fast as they can every time they go out the door. Coached athletes see just the opposite way. We don't do that. We only do those hard workouts very, very free and frequently. We don't do them every time we go out. Yeah. Okay. So let's focus on intensity because it is important. Sure. You don't ignore intensity altogether. Um, guidelines around intensity or, I mean, certainly the risk factor goes up within injuries as well. That's another point to consider mm. with intensity. Um, are we always doing intervals until we drop? Always doing 100% <laughs> until you just can't do it again. No, you are not. That was what I was telling you a while ago about when I was coaching athletes one-on-one. -on -one, my my job was to decide when to stop the workout. Yeah. Because uh, athletes will never make that decision uh, by themselves in appropriate manner. They will always think they could do one or two more. What I tell, what I began to tell athletes when they began to move away from me so I didn't have them face-to-face -face with me, is that when you feel like you can do one more stop, some would still do that one more, and that was usually a mistake. Mm. It, it has a lot to do with to keep doing that over all the time. It, it increases the opportunities of being injured, ill, overtrained. All these bad things begin to happen, and there's actually nothing they get out of that last interval that's of value except mm. that, that they can do it. Yeah. But there's nothing physiological coming from that. You've got to be able to learn to stop when when you're still have some freshness left. When you know you can do one more, you can finish it. Don't do it. Stop at that point. Yeah, yeah. All right. How about future thoughts around maybe wearables, um, technology, coaching, any kind of trends you see now that you see accelerating, or things you'd like to see being introduced into the world of endurance training? Yeah, acceleration is certainly the word to be used here. It's accelerating dramatically. Um, again, going back just in my history of this thing, you know, I, I didn't have stopwatch until 1971. I was already out of college by that point by five years. And so I was trying to like, you know, up until then, guess what you're doing as far as your running speed or your pace. And uh, 1970 or 1977, that ended with the heart rate monitor coming out from uh, – uh, from polar polar um, heart rate monitors, mm -hmm. and then ten years later, 1986, actually the first power meters invented by Uli Schober in uh, SRM. SRM, and so, but that didn't catch on until probably about 12 years later. Um, so these things were happening in very big gaps, you know, like a, a gap of 10 years before the next data uh, device comes out then a, a gap of 12 years before another device comes out. So these things are really far apart and you, you had lots of time to figure them out. Now it, it's hard to keep up with them on a, on a monthly basis. There's so <laughs> much stuff coming down the line. Right. You, you've got to be on top of it all the time to know what's going on next. Where we're headed next, 
I'm sure, is with a, a wearable lactate monitor. Uh, lactate testing has become extremely important for a lot of coaches and athletes um, in the last couple of years. And so I think we'll see the continuous glucose monitor, which, which has been around now for a few years. Like that same technology will be used for lactate. So it'll just be a device that has a perhaps a little pin in it that's stuck to your arm. And it measures lactate and gives you feedback, real-time feedback on what your lactate level is. And prescription are. from a coach could be there for yep. lactate. Yep. This is this is this is the level of lactate I want you to stay at. So that mm -hmm. that that'll be coming down the line. I, I feel real soon, mm -hmm. maybe within weeks or months of where we are right now. That'll be something that people are are using on a continuous basis. I saw another thing here. Um, uh, that some are using now. It's brand new. It's a, it's called a Caliber. It's a it's a face mask that measures um, gases. Uh, you know, oxygen you breathe in, and CO2, CO2 and CO2 you breathe out. And how what what your what, what your how your fat burning is going right now is that's one of the things being determined by this. The other mark markers also metrics, but that's one of the things. How much how am I doing at burning fat for a fuel? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's a device that gives you that. It's like five hundred bucks, I think, for that thing. So it's kind of pricey, but there'll be more that come out. Competitors, the price will start coming down, like polar, like power meters did. Um, so those are things down the line that I think we're going to see more of. But there'll be even things we haven't thought of yet that'll be coming around not too far in the future that will change the way we think about training. It's, right. It's it's like inevitable. And, and inevitably, there's a big hype around it. And everybody has to get on the bandwagon, but they don't really know much about it. Right. So it, it, it takes this natural length of time to bring in the data, see how it correlates with other data points and what are the learnings from it and what, what is the value of that new wearable or metric. Um, so it's sort of like, you know, you got to take it all in and, and hopefully communicate with other coaches and athletes. It's about learning from each other. It is. Yeah. Uh, I one thing I've learned is not to trust the company that makes the product to tell you how to use it. Uh, they typically they, they typically want to take you to the extreme. If I have a my my device on my wrist, my watch, it tells me I what my fitness level is right now, and they try to get me to to do harder, to go harder, to go faster. I'm not going fast enough, so I got to push myself harder to satisfy whatever the data is they're looking at that mm -hmm. makes these calls, I pay absolutely no attention to it, but I'm sure there are lots of athletes who look at that and say, I'm not going fast enough. I need to go faster because my watch is telling me to. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the problem we have is you don't want to listen to the person who made the product tell you how to use it other than the technology, how, how it works, what buttons you push and so forth. You want somebody who's, who's got experience with the, the thing, who's outside the company that tells you how to use it that person will be more inclined to give you information that's much more valuable than the manufacturer will. All right. So you're not hawking any uh, products today? <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's a great way to wrap things up, you know. Um, yeah, been a great, great uh, interview. Uh, and uh, you, you have more projects on the way, I'm sure. So I'm working on all kinds of stuff, you bet. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Man, great interview. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And uh, yeah, I can't say enough. Thanks for everything you brought to us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Training Peaks Coachcast. Visit trainingpeaks.com for more training and coaching resources.